skip to the end by the Vespers Bell. Let me just get the obvious out of the way first. Yes, I've actually been to the future. No, don't ask me about the pandemic or the climate crisis or the next election or next week's lotto jackpot. I've been to the far future, long after any of that has ceased to matter. It was billions of years, at least. It was the very end of the universe, I think. But it wasn't the end of everything. I should probably back up a little bit and explain how I got to the end of the universe. I'm an Air Force officer, and I was selected to be a test subject of what my superiors referred to as Chrononautical Kitty Hawk. Out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, relatively close to the Hawaiian Islands, there's a top-secret experimental particle collider. It's underwater both for secrecy and so that they can use the ocean as a heatsink for the massive nuclear reactor that powers the thing. I wasn't privy to all the details, so I don't even know who's funding it. There were definitely a lot of non-Americans there, so I'm pretty sure it was an international project. From what I was able to understand, the experiments they're doing there are meant to reveal the basic nature of time. Whether it's a fundamental aspect of the universe, an emergent property of more elementary components, or just an illusion of our own limited perception. The Collider produced an unknown and, based on what some of the researchers told me, previously untheorized particle that caused bizarre temporal effects when they interacted with ordinary matter. For the time being, they were just calling them chronotons, since that's what the time-traveling particles were called on Star Trek. When they saturated an object with these chronotons, it would vanish for a period of time roughly proportional to its mass and then reappear in the exact same space. Sometimes the object would be detectably hotter or colder. Sometimes they'd be damaged, and on at least one occasion, not even in one place. But as far as the scientists could tell, every atom they sent out came back, and never with any extraneous matter clinging on for the ride. The objects were clearly experiencing something during the missing time, but they couldn't send a probe since the chronotons would scramble any electronics, no matter what they did to protect it. It was decided that they needed to send a human test subject to report back on what they encountered. I was chosen because I hit the exact sweet spot of having the necessary skills and temperament, whilst also being sufficiently commonplace that should I never return, my commanders would write it off as an acceptable loss. I was assured that the chroniton radiation was non-ionizing, and that the tests they had run on biological samples showed no immediate or short-term ill effects. As for long-term effects, well, we just have to wait and see, wouldn't we? At this point, you may be asking yourself what I was getting paid to expose myself to unknown radiation and get blasted to God knows how far into the universe. The same Neil Armstrong got paid to go to the moon. Bupkus. Absolutely nothing outside of my regular salary. I'm an Air Force officer, after all, and putting my life on the line for the good of my country is all part of the job. I should be honored to have the privilege for being the first person sent into the future, they insisted. If the experiments were ever declassified, I'd be famous. Immortalized, even. And if I refused, I'd almost certainly be sent into military prison for insubordination. So, back to the future it was. I stepped into the collider, wearing a pressurized, environmental hazard suit. This was necessary not only out of concern for traveling to an unknown environment, but also because the interior of the collider needed to be evacuated of air to properly function. The collider itself was a hundred foot wide tunnel that stretched on for miles, panelled with a shiny grey alloy that I had been told had been invented for just this project. Every few hundred feet there was a glowing, humming ringing of classical tech encircling the perimeter, all of them pulsing in perfect synchrony. There was no sound in the airless tunnel, of course, but I could feel their thrumming vibration through my boots, and it was a sensation that I could only describe as humming. The rings were all interconnected by four evenly spaced conduits that ran the entire length of the collider, each pulsing with an orbiting light, which, in spite of the much greater distance, matched the RPM of the rings. I took my place on the clearly marked platform and looked up the cage, flashing lights that counted down the initiation sequence, protected from the chronotons by a recess of the collider wall. 
The near total silence was unnerving. All I could hear was my own breathing. I didn't even have a radio in my suit, since it would have just been scrapped by the chroniton wave. If there were any last minute instructions, they would only be conveyed through the display in front of me. As the countdown to full saturation ticked down, I started to see tiny golden lights forming in the space around me, whizzing around the collider at lightning speed. They were sparse at first, and after about a minute, they became so thick I could barely see through the haze. They passed through me like I wasn't even there, without producing any perceptible sensation as they did so. I couldn't see the countdown anymore, but when I felt my feet lift from the ground, I knew it was launch time. I slowly floated upwards for several seconds until I was in the dead middle of the collider, and hung there for several seconds more. I'm not going to lie, I was scared as hell, but I didn't panic or try to fight it. What was happening was happening, and I was long past the point of being able to do a damn thing about it. Without any sort of warning, I was catapulted forward at what felt like 5 Gs of force. The golden lights vanished, along with the collider the facility, the ocean, and the earth itself. I now passed through them as harmlessly as the chronotons had passed through me. I shot upwards, the earth beneath me seeming to spin at an impossible speed as I did so. The sun also receded at a pace too quickly for the theory of relativity to allow. I understood that I was not moving at superluminal speeds, but rather that my arrow of time had been accelerated, and what I took to be mere seconds were actually years, then centuries, then millennia, and aeons. Faster and faster I went, passing through star systems in a fraction of an instant, so quickly that I orbited the entire galaxy once every few seconds, like I was caught on some kind of out of control galactic treadmill. Jane, stop this crazy thing. <laughs> After God knows how long of that, time finally began to slow down again, and I began to descend upon a black planet orbiting a white star. Somehow, intuitively, I understood that this was Earth. The sun had expanded it to a red giant, charring the Earth black as it did so, then sunk to a white dwarf, left to slowly cool for the rest of its days. Modern science predicts that the expanding sun will actually consume the Earth. Whether this prediction is false, or if our space-faring descendants succeeded in widening the Earth's orbit, I don't know. From the high vantage point of space, I had deemed this dark earth long barren of any life, but upon groundfall, I had saw that I had erred in my judgement. I landed upon the earth as a cat would from a tree branch. My journey through time and space had done me no harm, and I was left to survey the ultimate fate of my homeworld. What I saw there was still dunes of blackened regolith. Long, long ago, the warming sun had evaporated the oceans and ruined the atmosphere for photosynthetic life. The force of entropy and erosion had beaten down all mountains and man-made structures, grinding them to dust. I could not help but be reminded of the poem Ozymandias, seeing everything lost to the global desert. The molten core had cooled, and the magnetosphere had weakened, leaving a more powerful solar wind to radiate the surface and gradually strip away the atmosphere. The red sun, though an internal fury in its death throes, had long since diminished to the white dwarf that hung in the darkening sky. Though what was left of the atmosphere would surely no longer be breathable to me were I to remove my helmet, the temperature was at least tolerable. All reason told me that nothing could survive such a cascade of apocalypses, and yet only a few hundred yards from where I stood was a single tree. If I had to guess, I'd say it was nearly a thousand feet tall. Its bark was black, but not blunt. Its dark leaves were sparse, but present, and many moon-white blossoms bloomed upon its branches. The tree cast a long shadow, like a sundial, and at its edges stood twelve evenly spaced humanoid statues in a circle, alternating male and female. They were large, but not enormous each being approximately twelve times my own height. Each had been hewn from a different colour of translucent crystal, exposing a luminescent network of veins and arteries lying within. Each statue held at least two orbs of light within themselves, 
one in their heads and one in their chest. Whilst a lone statue made in the image of a pregnant woman held a third, much brighter orb in her massive belly. I staggered towards the figures in awe, thinking that there was some sort of memorial left long ago by the last humans, something that could unironically bear the words, Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. All of humanity's final collective genius put into crafting everlasting monuments to our existence that would stand until the end of time. A single last act of defiance against the uncaring and undying void. That even when the earth had laid fallow for many times, the length it had ever bore life, and all was deduced to ash. This one single testament, not only to our existence, but to our exceptionality, remained standing at the end of all things. I stopped when I reached one of the statues, gazing up at it in wonder and reverence. I noted that what I had thought had merely been an aura of light. It was in fact composed of some vaporous substance that actively recoiled at my presence. In an act that seemed blasphemously daring to me, I tentatively stretched out my gloved hand and placed it upon the crystal surface. At the moment of contact, I felt a strange sensation flow through my body. It was neither pleasant nor painful, neither subtle or overwhelming. Simply strange and unlike any sensation I had felt since, or before, but nothing I can do to compare it to. It was then that the statue turned its head and looked down to me. Dumbfounded, I looked at the other eleven statues and saw that each was now staring directly at me, when before they had all been looking up at the great tree. I was hit with a sudden revelation then. This was not a monument left by the last men. These were the last men. The last men standing vigil around the last tree. They spoke to me then with some form of telepathy. Not with words, but with concepts. The language of thought that my mind processed in words and imagery and feelings. I perceived that they were the last of our post-human descendants. Their bodies made of materials utterly alien to the natural universe, of which even our greatest intellects have yet to hypothesize about. Each of them alone possessed knowledge which dwarfed that of our entire civilization. Cognitive capacities beyond our own, not only in degree but in kind, and a godlike control of the forces of nature. In Faraday's, many thousands of such entities had once walked the earth alongside a diverse array of both traditionally human and radically post-human races, and millions more dwelt amongst the stars. But over the vast stretches of cosmic time, even their race had dwindled. Some had perished in astronomically rare and powerful cataclysms, or in combat with other titans. Most, though, had transcended to even greater forms than the ones that stood before me, and left our reality behind as a hermit crab might discard a shell it had outgrown. Now, just the twelve before me were all that remained of their kind. They were not a random assembly of survivors, however, but each an archetypical embodiment of human character. Looking from one to another, I understood the nature of each. There was the humble commoner, the innocent maiden, the mischievous trickster, the wise sage, the bold adventurer, the skilled huntress, the defiant rebel, the passionate artist, the brave hero, the carnal lover, the powerful king, and the caring mother. Each held within themselves that which mattered most to them, what they deemed best of humanity, what they had sworn to safeguard until the universe itself was no more. And that time was now upon us, I saw then in their minds the nature of the apocalypse before us. The big rip. The dark energy of the universe having grown even greater, greater even than gravity, until millions of years ago the Milky Way and every other galaxy in creation had come undone, the stars shooting off from their orbits and into the intergalactic void. Months ago, solar systems had suffered the same fate, planets breaking off from their parent stars the Earth only remaining by the designs of the Titans before me. Now, in the final moments, the Earth itself would fall apart, 
followed by exponentially smaller constitutions of matter and then even space-time itself in a big rip singularity. Even the Titans would succumb to this apocalypse, but even in the face of their demise, I sensed that they still held hope. It was the mother who was the source of this hope, for the glowing light gestating within her womb was not a Titan child, but a new Big Bang singularity. Its design was born from the minds of each of the twelve Titans, its form forged from their own essences. If they were successful, this new singularity would survive the Big Rip and then explode into a new universe all of its own, and they would be reborn as gods. It was then that the earth beneath my feet began to shake and I knew it was time. The leaves and the flowers fell from the tree, their wafting descent the final omen of life that could not endure any longer, an omen the mother defied as she went into labor. The titans burst out into a hymn then, and in that moment their fate was the same as any other human, knowing they were to die with only faith that they would survive in some new form. Just as I thought that I too would be destroyed in the Big Rip Singularity, I started levitating again, and I knew that I was to return to my own time. Before I departed, however, the Trickster Titan plucked a single white blossom from the ground and placed it in my palm. Closing my fist around it, he winked, and I was off. I flew upwards away from the Earth and backwards from the Big Rip repeating my trip around the galaxy in reverse until I returned to a blue and green earth around a yellow sun. My return landing, though, was not nearly as smooth as my first. The instant my feet touched the platform, a shockwave cascaded through the collider, each ring violently exploding and showering the tunnel with shrapnel and strange plasma fires. The collider walls burst open and seawater came rushing in, sweeping me away and up towards the surface. I let go of the flower during all of this losing it to underwater eddies. I know the flower was the cause of the explosion. None of the other tests had ever brought anything back with them. The trickster had used this power to give me an impossible gift, and the cost was the destruction of the entire facility. I wasn't the only survivor, fortunately, but the facility was destroyed beyond repair. When I was debriefed, I told them about the flower, about everything, but they didn't believe me. They took the absence of the flower as proof that the whole thing was a fever dream, and nothing I had experienced was real. I felt a bit like Cassandra then, having been gifted with a divine revelation that no one would believe. But on the bright side, that means they didn't fault me with the destruction of the facility. I don't know if they intend to rebuild the facility or not, but if they do, they'll surely think long and hard before risking another human test subject. Billions of dollars for a weird drug trip is a bit pricey after all. After a battery of tests and a lengthy observation period, I was, I was released and allowed to return to an act of duty, deemed to be none worse for the wear after my brief visit to the end of time. I also, of course, had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, swearing to never breathe a word of it to anyone. So, why am I telling you all of this now? because the flower came back to me. Last night, whilst I was on leave, I was taking a stroll by myself down the beach, my experience with the Titan still weighing heavy on my mind. I'm sure it always will. I was constantly re-examining everything I had witnessed, everything they had told me, forever uncertain if I was interpreting all of it correctly, or if it had ever really happened. I wondered if the Titans had been successful in creating a new universe, if they had been reborn into it, or if they had failed their greatest trial and were torn apart with everything else, leaving only true existential nothingness in their wake. I was walking just close enough to the ocean for the waves to caress my feet, and right in front of me, an incoming wave deposited a flower glowing like the moonlight. In disbelief, I dropped to my knees and scooped it up in my hands, vigorously scrutinizing it, lest I be deceived to wishful thinking and mere coincidence. But there was no doubt in my mind that this was the same flower. The flower from the last tree the trickster titan had gave me. A radiant, silvery-white lotus bloom, stamens of metallic hydrogen and speckles of starlight upon its flawless petals. 
it had returned to me. I know not why the trickster gave it to me, but it appears it is not a gift that can be discarded so easily. I had not given much to the thought of the tree before then, to be honest. If anything, I had thought its survival a mere token act of conservationism by the Titans. But the gift of this flower and its impossible return indicated that it was more than this. Did the tree serve as some part of the Titans' ultimate plans? Did taking the flower back to the present with me aid in their goals? Am I supposed to do something with it? I can't know for certain, of course, but I think the answer to all of those is yes. Beyond that, I have no idea. I wish that the trickster had given me more than a wink in instructions. Maybe my mortal limitations are to be blamed for being so obtuse. But it seems that if they were so smart, they could have found a way to make their intentions clear to me. As much as I would like to believe I am the chosen one, meant to enact the will of the gods to ensure the salvation of reality, there is one doubt that lingers in my mind. Why was it the trickster titan to give me the flower? If it had been their collective will, then I take the flower back to my own time, then nearly any one of them, other than the trickster, would have been more suitable a gift bearer, save for the rebel. Was it simply he who was nearest at the moment? Or is it not more likely that it was playing a trick on me or his fellows by giving me the flower? Or is it merely that my mission requires some uncertainty, some doubt, some lack of any clear direction to succeed? Over and over I've been asking myself why it was the trickster who gave me the flower. The only answer comes to me as a quote from the author Neil Gaiman. Of course it was Loki. It was always Loki.